My name is Megan, and on behalf of myself and my fellow city co-workers that you see here, I just want to thank you for coming out and uh, taking this time to talk with us about a really important event. Tonight we're holding our public engagement session for Group 2 for Surveillance Technologies. I'm going to give a quick overview of the night, kind of lay some ground rules, and then we'll get started because I know everyone is really eager to talk about this very important subject um, on what exactly the tech surveillance technologies are that we're going to discuss tonight. So first, before we get started, I want to talk about what is the city's definition of surveillance. So it's up here on the board, but I'm going to go ahead and read it word for word for you as well. Surveillance is defined as technologies that observe or analyze the movements, behavior, or actions of identifiable individuals in a manner that is reasonably likely to raise concerns about civil liberties, freedom of speech or association, racial equity, or social justice. Certain technologies, such as police body cameras and technologies for everyday office use, are excluded from this law. Now, before we get started, I want to introduce Jim Loader, our Director of Digital Engagement, to talk a little bit more about surveillance. Thanks, Megan. Um, <clears throat> I'm Jim Loader. I'm the Director of Digital Engagement for the City of Seattle. Uh, my area covers, uh, among other things, the privacy program. Uh, uh, staff from which are, are here today and put this event together and are responsible for implementing and administering the city's surveillance ordinance. Uh, so the city of Seattle believes that gaining and maintaining the public's trust about information management uh, is a key responsibility and is critical to our successful operations as a city. The city needs to collect information in order to deliver services and to ensure that we're providing equal and fair access to public resources. Some of our departments also use specialized technologies for public safety purposes, to investigate crimes, to monitor and control traffic, and to protect uh, people and property. The information that we collect from the public to deliver these services and run the city can be very sensitive. And our privacy program exists to ensure that city residents know what's being collected about them and how it's being used. My team conducts hundreds of privacy reviews each year, working with city departments to identify risks to personal privacy and civil liberties, to recommend and implement mitigations to those risks, and to ensure that new technologies and programs meet our privacy commitments. With that background, we are now focusing today for our topic this evening, surveillance technologies. The city's surveillance ordinance took effect on September 1st, 2017. The purpose of the ordinance, as Megan outlined, is to ensure that the public is informed about the use of technology that can observe individual movements and behaviors. It requires that city council must approve the use of these technologies after a public uh, engagement and public comment process. The City of Seattle is dedicated to providing the public with information about these technologies and how they're used. We're also committed to using these technologies and the data collected by them in a manner that meets our commitments to racial equity, social justice, and individual privacy. This is a meeting for us to present information to you about the technologies that are currently in use and are up for review. It's also an opportunity for you to ask questions of our experts and to leave your comments here with us or online for the city council to consider as they conduct their review. So now I'm gonna turn things back over to Megan, who'll go over the details of our program tonight. Thanks. All right, thank you, Jim. So uh, as we mentioned tonight, we are gonna go ahead and hear from four departments. We've got the Department of Transportation, Police Department, Fire Department, and Seattle City Light. These departments are going to give a brief presentation about their technologies, and then you'll see in the back of the room they're all sitting at tables where we have subject matter experts who can further answer your questions. So once we're finished with the presentations, please feel free to wander back there and um, chat with them a little bit more if you have further questions. Uh, we also have some snacks over here, so please feel free to help yourself as we go on through the evening. So one of the reasons we're here tonight is to collect your comments, and there are three ways to leave a comment. We've got comment cards on all of the tables and at the, the tables with the technologies in the back. Please feel free to fill them out and leave them in one of the many white boxes or leave them with myself or one of the many city employees that you see here tonight. We'll be happy to take these comments for you. If you want to think about the information you've heard here tonight and put something online, 
online, no problem. It's all right at seattle.gov slash privacy. You can submit that online. Or you can go old school and mail us something. Who doesn't love getting mail? Um, we want to go over some of the ground rules for the evening tonight. We're here to about to, to excuse me. We're here to talk about the technologies that are currently in use with Group Two. Um, all of these subject matter experts will fill you in on all of the information you need to know about it. We are here to share thoughts, so please be polite and allow others to have time to speak as well. We want to keep it civil and respectful. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our first department, which is the Department of Transportation, and I would like to introduce Jason Cambridge. Thanks, Megan. So as we all know, traffic is a big deal in our city. We're one of the nation's fastest growing cities, which means there's thousands of new people traveling on our streets every year. And travel time is one of the most important pieces of information that we can use to determine how well our streets are operating. We've partnered with Acyclica to provide us that travel time information. We have over 300 of their units installed throughout the city. Each unit consists of a small sensor that's installed inside of a traffic signal control cabinet. And these sensors recognize when Wi-Fi enabled uh, devices like smartphones or laptops or tablets move past one of their sensors. Now, a cyclic hub puts in a number of measures to determine that people's privacy is protected through the course of this process. And the way that it works is your Wi-Fi enabled device is consistently probing and looking for networks that it could possibly join. So a cyclical sensor recognizes that and it captures the MAC address from that Wi-Fi enabled device. Now, a MAC address is assigned by the manufacturer and it's hard coded into the hardware of that device. And these device manufacturers are not required to register that MAC address with any sort of governing body or centralized authority. And no database exists where you can put in a MAC address and determine who's the user or owner of that device. Once they receive the MAC address, they immediately encrypt it and send it up to Acyclica's cloud servers uh, for further processing. And once they receive the MAC address, the first thing that they do is add a random bit of data to the end of that MAC address in a process called salting. And they do that on a rotating daily basis, so that allows them to know, hey, this is a device that's making a trip on day one, but they wouldn't know that it's the same device making trips on subsequent days. And then the final thing that they do is they transform that, ha that MAC address uh, with the salt bed at the end into something completely different by using a hashing algorithm. And that changes it into a completely different uh, string of information. And that's what they're storing and using to create the travel times. They never store the raw MAC address that's never available to SDOT or Cyclica. They simply use this hashed value combined with GPS information along with a timestamp to determine how long it's taking uh, trips to be made through the city. And that's what's provided back to SDOT is strictly this aggregated average travel time information along many of our primary corridors. And we use this information in a variety of ways. We provide it in real time. We put it on large overhead signs as you're driving through the city. You can know how long it takes to reach popular destinations from that starting point. We also have a whole team of engineers who are responsible for the traffic signal timing in our city. And they use modeling software. And uh, travel uh, time information really informs the effectiveness of their actions, because they could look at the travel time along a street, and then they could uh, begin to do research, use their modeling software, try to make improvements to the operation of that street, and then look subsequently at the travel times to determine, hey, did I improve the traffic flow here? Or can I perhaps uh, make some more changes to perhaps make things work a little bit better? So we believe that we can use technology to improve the efficiency of our streets. And this partnership helps us improve safety and mobility for all travelers. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. All right, next up, we are going to hear from the police department. So I would like to bring up, here he is. Deputy Chief, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. OK, I wanted to make sure I got that part right. It's very important. Deputy Chief Mark Garth Green. Thank you. Wow, good crowd. Awesome. <laughs> there we go. All right, thanks. Uh, my name is Mark, and uh, happy to be here and chatting this evening. Uh, and so I'm going to go through the programs and then I'll be in the back to, uh, for more questions. But we have three uh, distinct technologies that we're reporting on this evening. First one is our computer-aided uh, dispatch. 
And so what this does is when somebody calls into 911 and says, I have an emergency, car accident, let's say, we start taking that information down. Now, the old ways of doing it, we used to actually write it out on a three by five card. We'd clip it to a string and our call taker would pull the string and it would go across the desk area and then the dispatcher would get it and then they'd read it. And so uh, as we advance in technology, uh, we move along, we do things a little better now. So what ends up happening, the calls come in, we type up the calls, that information then gets sent over to our dispatchers who are able to dispatch the call, give that information. That information then goes out to our vehicles as well, and to our computers there. Uh, so our officers in the field can actually read what they're hearing as well and then go to the call. Also, it captures everything that's kind of said between the officers and the dispatchers. So when we call back and ask for information, the dispatchers update the CAD log is what we call it. And so what we have then is a running timeline from the time the call came in until the conclusion of the call uh, once we've signed off with the report. But it allows SPD to allocate patrol resources effectively. So we start looking uh, across the boards of how we're moving our folks around, where we're getting them to. When you think about it, we took 900,000 calls, and it's always weird when you start talking about numbers, uh, but we took over 900,000 911 calls, but then you look at it and says, well, it's 250,000 CAD events. So the first obvious question is, what happened to the other 650,000, right? Did we just forget about them? No. What ends up happening is a lot of times you have multiple callers about the same thing. So it only becomes one actual call, but we tie everybody to it. So we're taking a lot of calls in, uh, but we actually, what we actually dispatch out and write up our CAD events are about 250,000. And then 135,000 or more are actually generated by officers in the field. Uh, so it's not a 911 call, but they're out there working and putting things in. So people say, well, what is on the CAD call? So what we do is we capture the information that we get from our 911 caller. So we get an address of where the location is, where the, the crime is, any information that the caller wishes to give us about who they are, if they want to remain anonymous, the descriptions of the actual event that we're actually going to go to. And we capture that information. And then, again, as I said, any subsequent uh, information that comes in either from the field or if the caller's still on the line and giving us additional information, that's actually captured in that CAD log as well. So we get a lot of information from in there. And then it aids in our, um, uh, and when we go back and write our reports, we can look at that and look at the actual timestamps of when we were there and what we were doing. That CAD dispatch does become uh, a part, that CAD record becomes a part of our criminal case. So in the case if there's actually a crime committed, we arrested somebody and it goes to prosecution and it goes over to the courts, that CAD log actually becomes part of the criminal file that is then given over to um, the prosecutors to work through it. So what we're doing there is just going back from the three by five cards, now to update technology with those great things, Microsoft Windows and different things, and put this information in a more usable manner and we're able to respond more quickly uh, and far more efficiently than ever before. So we'll jump to the next one, 911 logging recorder. So when somebody calls 911, we automatically start recording uh, the information, right? So when you pick up the phone, it's kind of like that, uh, you know, whenever you're calling, Sears, or they're almost out of business now, but anyways, uh, the customer support service, they always say, you know, be, we're, we're recording this for a customer service. Well, we record it for a lot of reasons. The biggest reason is so we can capture that information and get it. So from the moment you call in, we're recording that. We're also recording what the dispatchers are actually saying to the officers out in the field and what the officers out in the field are saying back to dispatch. So all of that is recorded and kept on our uh, recording. Now, this becomes really important to us, and I'll give you an illustration. Uh, we had a very serious event up in the North End, it was in the newspapers a while back here. And during that event, um, we were trying to actually ascertain what apartment we needed to get into. Uh, and we had a very excited person on the phone. Uh, we had a language uh, line issue that we were trying to deal with, and we were actually at the wrong apartment to begin with. Right apartment building, we were just on the first floor, like 101, and it was 301, something along those lines. So we actually had to go back and listen to the recording real quick to try to capture and grab that apartment number, which ultimately allowed us to get up into that apartment and then safeguard some of the folks that were in there. Unfortunately, other bad things happened in there, but we were able to get some folks out safely. And that was because we were able to go back and listen to this recording in real time to figure out where we were. So it's kind of an example of how we utilize it so again, we're talking about 900,000 or more calls that are received each year, and 5,000 recordings are released to the Seattle Law Department. Because again, 
these 911 recordings become part of a criminal case file as well. So when they go to the prosecutor's office, the prosecutors uh, and defense attorneys have access uh, to all these. We also keep them there so we can do quality control and uh, training with them. So if we get a complaint, somebody says uh, an officer did something or the 911 dispatcher was, didn't listen to my uh, call, I asked for some assistance, they didn't give it to me, we can go back and actually look at it just kind of like that Sears customer service model we were just talking about, right? We can go back in and look to say, okay, send it over to our Office of Police Accountability and they will pull that call and start listening to it to see uh, kind of what happened or what services we were supposed to do. We'll also utilize it for training when we're making mistakes or just how do we improve our process, right? Not even that it's a mistake, but how do we get better at it, right? So we need to have that data, those different things so we can look at it so we can figure out how to improve and be more efficient and get a better service and better product out there. So that's kind of what we use that for. And we'll jump into the last one is CopLogic. So CopLogic is our internet-based reporting system. Um, and what we've found kind of over, over time is there's a lot of folks who wish to report kind of, and I don't want to say low-end crimes or, or low-level, uh, because any crime is important to folks, but ones that they don't necessarily want overt, overly too, many, uh, too much police involvement. Let's say uh, you wake up in the morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, you're going to work, you walk outside and your car window is broken out. Right? So you're going to go back and you're going to call 911, and unfortunately if it's a busy day, you may wait quite a long time before we can get there to you. So now not only do you have to suffer with a broken window, you now have to suffer with going to work late. Uh, and really all you need is a police report case number to give to your insurance company so you can get your window fixed. Right? And so what, what happens traditionally is we start looking at using technology, which is what we did, and using an online public interface where people can log on and they can report their crime over the internet to us, fill out a police report. Now what happens is when you fill out that police report, it gets sent uh, to us. We have a sworn officer, so just like somebody who would come out to your house, they sit there and they review and go through the police report. So they make sure that it's accurate, that it has all the information that they need. If it doesn't, they will contact that person back to get an updated sense of that information. And then it gets uh, entered in our RMS just like a regular report. So everything that's on there is the same thing that you would give if I walked up to you as a police officer, with the exception of we ask for email addresses, Sometimes police officers will ask for them, um, sometimes we don't, uh, just when we're out in a public face-to-face, -face, but uh, that's the primary method of way we can do it. So the nice thing about this uh, for folks is when you get that car prowl at eight in the morning, you go to work, you go get your window fixed at nine o'clock at night when you're back home and, and feed her up and dinner's over, you can log on and go ahead and report that. So you're not having to wait around to do it. Uh, if you're riding the bus in, you can sit there on your smartphone and, and do it then at that point too. So it allows a lot more flexibility for uh, crimes where there's really no suspect description, that there's uh, no evidence. Um, it's just you woke up and something happened, right? And so we work through it on that end. Again, so we, re we review them by sworn officers. We'll take a look at them before we transfer them into our system. Um, so in 2017, we had 14,356 crimes reported to CopLogic, which actually saved us more than about a million dollars in personal costs of having somebody go out into the field and actually take that report. So it allows that, uh, so if you're calling in, we'll send an officer, but for a lot of folks, they don't want to see the officer, they would rather on their own time do it, so this allows them uh, the ability to do that as well. So those are the three. We're going to be in the back. I'll be here for questions, uh, and I will turn it back over. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you again, Deputy Chief Mark Garth Green. So up next is the fire department, and I would like to introduce Evan Ward. Hey folks, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so I'm fortunate that uh, the police department happened to go over my technology pretty well already. Um, so I, I'll touch a, a, just a few things that may be a little bit different, but um, it, it is basically the same system. It's our computer-aided dispatch system. Uh, we have a, a different dispatch center. We have a fire alarm center you may have seen. It's just down here a, a couple blocks. Um, and that's where this picture is taken. So. Uh, CAD has already been pretty well explained, but what it is is basically a, it's a series of technologies that allow us to intake uh, emergency calls and dispatch them at the appropriate levels. Um, the thing I really want to stress here is 
we cannot provide the same level of service that the, the folks at Seattle enjoy right now without CAT. Um, you could go back and actually at our fire alarm center, you can go see that old switchboard and the way it, it looks. Uh, but while we don't have the same volume as the police department, we still process somewhere shy of about 200,000 911 calls each year. Um, like I said, it, it allows us to determine, you know, what is the nature of the emergency? What is the appropriate level of response? How many uh, trucks, how many aid cars do we need to send? All of that is what CAD allows us to do appropriately. So uh, it's really the, the beginning point of the, the mission that we provide to the citizens of Seattle and the folks who, who visit us. Um, so uh, one of the things we, we take very seriously is medical privacy. Um, and oftentimes people call us, uh, they're having the worst day of their life, uh, they're providing really, really sensitive information to us, and we take that very seriously. So uh, a lot of that information may you know, wind up in CAD so we can make sure we send a, a medical uh, ambulance instead of, say, a basic life support unit. Um, but we want to make sure that all of that information is protected. So only certain folks have access to that information. Um, the other thing is a question I wanted to pose to all of you is, are, has anybody here ever looked at or become familiar with real-time 911? Anybody? Any hands? That's CAD. That's where this information comes from. So obviously there's more in CAD that we, we're not going to share with the, the public at large because we're concerned about the, the security and the privacy of our patients. Um, but there's a lot of really good info in there that I know that, that everyone in the public wants to see. So uh, CAD is uh, really, it's the beginning point for the mission of the Seattle Fire Department. So thank you. Thank you, Evan. Okay, last but not least, our last technology tonight is City Light, and I would like to bring up Adam Philby. Okay, I promise no CAD slide. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, yeah, a few technologies we want to talk about, and I assure you that these technologies are not um, used to monitor uh, any behaviors of individuals. We use this technology to monitor meter equipment, um, distribution systems, and they're tools that, that really sort of help preserve the integrity um, of our power distribution system, okay? So you see the binoculars? Uh, those binoculars are used by our amazing meter electricians that go out there and, you know, they can't get close to a meter because, you know, there's a beware of dog sign, right? There's, you know, some unsafe condition, right? And so, you know, the safety of our employees uh, is extremely important to us. And, and so when we run into those situations, they pull out a pair of binoculars and they can read the meter from a distance, right? Makes sense, right? Um, we're not monitoring any people, we're just looking at the equipment, getting the read off the meter, and we use that uh, in, in different um, cases, you know, to make sure that we have accurate bills for our customers, okay? Uh, <clears throat> a couple other pieces of equipment, you know, you can certainly see there that, uh, that those uh, devices are used again for monitoring power consumption. Uh, there's an amp stick and then there's the, the TMS that's on the transformer, which is just a transfer meter system. Again, just uh, getting accurate power load uh, off the distribution system. Uh, and this helps us in cases where there may be some current diversion in place where a customer you know, may be diverting current uh, around the meter. And so when we have cases of current diversion come up, we do an investigation, we use these tools to ensure that we're getting um, you know, the proper information um, so that we can bill the customer for the power that they use. And obviously as a rate payer, that's important. <coughs> um, Next slide. Uh, last year, just to add to that real quick, last year we recovered $1.6 million throughout, uh, through our current diversion process. So it is a value added uh, effort and uh, certainly as a rate payer, that's important, right? Um, so I mentioned, so what do we use it for? We, we collect the information, uh, you know, we build the case, uh, we use it to preserve the integrity of our equipment. Um, and it helps with our investigations, right? So again, three uh, pieces of, of equipment, three pieces of technologies that our meter electricians are using out there to preserve 
um, the distribution system and to help us ensure that we're billing the customers for the power that they used. Okay. And we'll be back there with myself and Diane Clement, who is our current diversion coordinator. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, so before we break into the open house portion of our event tonight, I just wanna remind you to fill out the comment card that you see on your table or on any of the back tables back there with the uh, uh, technology experts. So there's, again, three ways, like I talked about earlier. You can fill out one of the cards and leave them with us tonight or online or mail them to us. So the comments that are left on these cards, they are gonna be used to collect the information and include it in the surveillance impact reports, which are gonna be submitted to the surveillance advisory working group. And then they go to the city council for the review in full vote. So your comments tonight will be read and they're very important and that's why we're here to have this event tonight to capture these thoughts and comments that you all have on this. So at this time, we wanna let you know, you can get up and go ahead and talk to the uh, subject matter experts in the back of the room. Again, we have snacks, uh, also very important. But one thing that is perhaps the most important thing from tonight, which is breaking news, we just decided to do this today, is we're gonna be extending the comment period. It was gonna end earlier in early March, but now due to just some of the inclement weather that we had earlier this month that pretty much brought Seattle to a standstill with our historic snowfall, we are gonna be um, extending our public comment period to Tuesday, March 26th. So there's plenty of time to uh, leave a comment to share that link with about 30 of your closest friends so to make sure that they can leave a comment as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up the presentation portion and open up the tables. All right, thank you so much.